Brother Eli, would you like the Sunday school offering, please? Oh, good morning, and what a beautiful day it is to be in the house of the Lord. We've been looking at evangelism and our need to tell the lost about Christ before it's too late. And whose responsibility is it for us uh, to take the message of the gospel to those who don't know it? Ours. It is ours. And the Bible doesn't just tell us to go and tell the lost, but God commands us to go out and tell the lost about Jesus Christ and the way to salvation. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15 states, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every message. God didn't say go if you want to, but he said go. And as we've been looking at that, it's important for us to know what we believe and why we believe it. And for the most part, we do. We know the gospel message and leads it up to inform someone on how to be saved. We know that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We know that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we know that there is only one way to get into heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. Because he died on the cross for our sins, and because he rose again on the third day, validating the fact that he is not just another man, but he is the Messiah. He was God. With all those things combined, that is the gospel message in a nutshell. So we know enough to tell others about Christ and how to get saved. We don't need to know every verse in the Bible. We, may, we don't even have to know where things are in the Bible. We've already talked about tools for reaching the lost. How you can have a Bible with a verse highlighted and a tab in all right parts. So you can show them the gospel message. You don't have to memorize all these little numbers. Should we try? Absolutely. Because we are commanded to study to show ourselves approved unto God. And if there's no other reason in the world for trying to memorize verse and chapter and book, we ought to do it for ourselves. Because we should study the Word of God. We should try to memorize it because we want to hide it in our heart. And from there, it goes out. Once we know what we believe and why we believe it, then it's important for us to try to know what other people believe. So we may know how to reach them. We are commanded to be ready to give an answer to every man a reason of the hope that lies within you. And while we may not have to know all the ins and outs, we, may, we should want to know about other people and what they believe why, for one reason alone. That way we know how to best present the gospel message to them. When we look, started looking at Catholicism, we looked at their opening statement concerning salvation. And let me pop back there and just reread that once again. And when it comes to the doctrine of grace, the Catholics claim that the sinner is saved by grace, not on the account of his or own human or any human merit, but purely through the merits of Jesus Christ. If we take that statement by itself, does that sound like the gospel message? how we believe it according to the Bible. It does, to the T. But when we begin studying, we realize that there is different, there are differences in their meanings of some of the words versus what the Bible states concerning those words. Like justification, sanctification, and grace. So when we look at their salvation phrase in a nutshell, it sounds like our gospel message. But the more that we study it out, we find that they place a lot of emphasis on works through the definite through their definition of those words. So, as a, so we see right there a pure great example why we should try and study what other people believe. Not because it's to change what we believe, but simply so we can better present the gospel message to them. We begin, we looked at grace, we looked at sanctification. We looked at water baptism, which is just an outward sign. We looked at their, the Bible and how they viewed it versus um, how we view it, how they believe that there are other things added onto the Bible that are requirements to salvation. 
whereas we believe the Bible is the whole is our guide to salvation. No works or anything else added to it. Do you remember what that those extra books? What are those books of the Bible called that the Catholics take most of their doctrine from? That are off the wall. I heard you, bro. I was trying to pull one everybody else. They are called the Apocrypha. And the word itself does not mean anti books, but rather they mean false teachings. Do you remember where they, when they were written between? What, what time frame were they written in? And there were silence in heaven for the span of 30 minutes or the entirety of Sunday school, right? Very good, brother. Between the Gospels and Malachi, those 500 years of quote-unquote silent years. What's important about the Apocrypha is, did the Jews during that time from which they were written accepted them as the inspired word of God? No, they did not. They considered them false. Thus, they get the name Apocrypha. Apocrypha. But that is where the doctrine of purgatory comes from. They're worshiping of the saints. So the Catholic Church is not anywhere near time about to get rid of those books. We also learned that in the 1950s, 1970s, the Catholic Church went through Reformation and they changed some things. Did they change any of the core beliefs? No. They changed maybe some of their traditions, whereas Mass may not be entirely in Latin, or some Mass might be in the common tongue, and the Orthodox is in Latin. But the main doctrines of the Church remain the same. Then we go on to the doctrine of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and how the Catholic Church esteems her highly, and I know that took us all as a surprise. No, not really. But when we look at the Word of God, it is clear that Mary was a human being just like you and I. And when I say you and I, I wouldn't even put her on the same category as a human as Jesus Christ, because we know Jesus Christ was 100% man, but he was also 100% God. And that's where the Catholics come into play with Mary, the mother of Jesus. They place her on a pedestal. Satan, that she was always a perpetual virgin, that she's esteemed as equal to God. And when we look at the scriptures, that is not true at all. In fact, Mary, the mother of Christ, didn't even view herself in such a manner. She viewed herself as needing a Savior as well. And we know that only sinners need a Savior. We ended on looking at the adoration or the worship of Mary. And we ended up concluding on that last week, how the Catholic Church worships her. Even if they claim that they don't, we know that in their own wording, in their own writings, that they do. Um, taken from their own writings, I worship thee, O great queen. The, church, the Holy Church commands they worship peculiar to Mary. By entrusting yourself to Mary, you receive Christ. In Mary, the Word was made flesh. And the list goes on and on. We looked at that last week. But when we look at Mary, really she was a blessed individual. Not above people or any other individual, but among. And when we look at the Word of God, we see that there were other people that were considered quote-unquote blessed. But yet, they don't have shrines, and the Bible nowhere tells it, instructs us to worship them. And Mary is no different. And even there was a woman that came to Jesus one day and said, Blessed are your mother, in the short of it. And what did Jesus do? He rebuked her. Because Mary was just another individual like you and I. And there is only one individual who is worthy of worship. And that is God. Now the Catholic Church, they like to teach that Mary is a co-redeemer with Christ. What does that mean? 
that she is a mediator as well. She is a go between between us and God. The Catholics may actually even use the word mediatrix. And when you look at that, all it is is a female mediator. That is all that is. But they claim that she is a go between between God and man as well. They state that in their own writings. The beautiful relationship that God has established between Mary and all men is expressed by the title of the, of the co-redeemer. Christ intended her as the co-operator to suffer with him, to pray with in the work of redemption. As Christ works, as Christ's work of redemption was to go on to the end of time, so must Mary's work of cooperation in redemption. That is taken from the book How to Explain What You Believe as a Catholic. And Pope Pius made this statement. By the will of God, the most blessed virgin Mary was inseparable, inseparably, inseparable, joined with Christ. And in your notes, Christ's name is not Christian short, it is Christ in full. In accomplishing the work of man's redemption. So when we look at the Catholic Church, they teach that Mary is co-equal with God, that Mary had an equal work in man's redemption when it comes to salvation and the covering of our sins. <coughs> we read it from the lips of Pope Pius ourselves. But what does the Bible state concerning the redemption of sin and Mary as being co-redeemer with Christ? Thou shalt have no other God before me. When we look and study the Word of God, we can read it word for word, verbatim, verbatim, study it in the fullest detail in the Latin, in the Greek, in the Aramaic, and guess what? We will not find a single reference to Mary having any work with Christ in the cross, and we will not see her being definitely not placed on equal footing with Christ in this work. In fact, Scripture actually condemns such a teaching. If someone would please read John chapter 14 and verse 6. John 14 and verse 6. And if someone else would like to find Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. Revelation 22, 18 and 19, and just hold that for the time being. So Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me and my mother. No. Oh. <laughs> Jesus was not a longing boy, and he said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Why would he make such a statement? Because he is the only way. This world teaches that there are many paths to get to heaven. The Catholics claim that Mary had a co-equal work with Christ on the cross. And the butler and the answer goes, eh, wrong. That is not the case at all. Jesus is the only way to gain salvation and to get entrance into heaven. And when it comes to this teaching that Mary is co-redemptive, well, put it this way, that Mary has an equal work with Christ in our salvation process, what does the Bible say concerning Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19?
So there is only one way into heaven. There is no adding on to it. There is no reading in the scripture. And even when we study in the original context of the Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, we still find Mary written nowhere in the side margins. Also, when we look at Jesus Christ, when we study the gospel, and we can study with fine-tooth hook comb, never, ever, ever has he addressed Mary in such a way to place her above anyone else when it comes to redemption and spiritual grace. <coughs> he always placed her on the same footing. We talked about, we read the passage last week when the woman said, bless for the paths that nurse you, and something else added in there that I don't remember. Basically, esteeming Mary, the mother of Jesus, Jesus said, don't do that. So Jesus never, ever, ever places her in such a high regard that she has work in his redemption process. Not even in his own life. We, as we read Luke last week, Mary herself admitted that she needed a Savior. If Mary needed a Savior, that tells us one thing. That truly the verse that states, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, was true because she had been sinned in her own life. She had to go to the temple every year and offer the sacrifice, just like everybody else. We also see Mary and Joseph, her being included there at the birth of Christ, offering the sin sacrifice of two turtle doves. Is that dramatic enough? That being the sacrifice of a poor individual. But even Mary recognized that she needed a Savior. So she did not have any part in the redemptive work of man, but rather she herself needed redeeming. She acknowledged that. And if that's not enough, what's in, what does Acts chapter 1 and verse 14 state? Acts 1.14. So these all continued and went forward with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the, his brother. What's happening in this passage? But regardless, we're going to talk about 
How Mary did not actually die, but the Catholics believe that she ascended into heaven. Miraculously. So in 1950, the Pope declared this. We pronounce, that is a typo, we and declared and defined it to be divinely, divinely revealed dogma that the immaculate or the sinless mother of God, the ever virgin Mary, have completed, having completed the course, course with an E, of course, and then they just dropped off because of silence. On this earthly life was assumed bodily and soul, assumed body and soul into heavenly glory. So when we look at this, the Catholics believe that the Virgin Mary was taken into heaven. She did not die and experience death as we know of it, but she ascended into heaven, probably in similar manner as Jesus Christ himself did, because we know that when Christ, after the resurrection, he was on the earth for 40 days, and then he ascended into the clouds, and in like manner he shall come. And we... The Catholics believe something similar to be true of Mary. She never died, but she was escorted into heaven. However, that was. I do not know. I don't have it in my notes. How come she had other children? It's a miracle, brother. Everything about the Virgin Mary is a, is a miracle. But when we look at the Virgin Mary, we know that they believe that she never died. In, 19, in September of 1976, Anne Katharina Emmerich tells a story of it. She was a 19th century stigmatic nun and a mystic. Stigmatic nun, if you've ever seen any documentaries or anything, some people mistake, mysteriously get the marks of Christ in their hands, their wrists. They might start bleeding where the crowns were. And there's a big deal of it. If it really happens, I couldn't tell you, but that's what they claim. But anyhow, she, that's where the stigmata comes from. And she was a mystic. And as soon as we hear the mystic, the entire church would step back and go, Oh, I know where this is going. <laughs> because we know exactly what mystics are. And we know that they don't come with eyes full of light, but they come with eyes full of darkness, meaning that they're demonic. They're witches. Anyhow, moving on. She said to have been privileged to have viewed the events of the Holy Family as on a screen that unrolled before her. How this was, I don't know. Maybe she saw the old films, you know, where you see the three, two, one, it's all black and white, and it's like rolling, and Charlie Chaplin's going, yada, yada, yada. I don't think it was high def like we have today, but anyhow, she saw it as it playing out on a screen before her. As it unrolled. And she... The mystic relates that she relates that before Mary's death she took communion and it was that the roof of her room disappeared and a pathway of light formed on each side of which it was on each side were happy and angelic faces. Mary's body rose and became suspended in midair, hands raised towards heaven, and a figure of light also with raised arms issued from her body, and Mary's soul joyfully went to meet her divine son. Escorted heavenward by choirs of angels, our Lord placed in her hands a scepter with a gesture towards the earth, as though indicating the power which he gave her. Her earthly body then sank back upon the couch. The souls of many of her loved ones accompanied her heavenward, and a multitude of other souls were released from purgatory. What a day that must have been. <laughs> Many, Mary's bodily assumption took place the night after her death, accompanied by Jesus and a multitude of angels. The blessed soul of Mary, <coughs> floating before Jesus, penetrated through the rock and into the tomb, of, and into the tomb out of which she again rose, radiant with light in her glorified body, escorted by the entire multitude of the celestial spirits, Return in triumph to the heavenly Jerusalem. To the apostle Thomas, who arrived after this event, John showed the empty tomb and coffin and cried, She is no longer here! 
And that is the account of that mystic named Katharina Emmerich. And that is part of where they get it from. Now, when we look at the accounts of Mary, we know that the Catholics believe that she was taken into heaven a grand vesture. We've already read that from one person's account. But we know that they claim that she went grandly, she was co-equal with God. And since then, believe it or not, people have seen Mary all around the world. She's known by um, different names around different cultures. In the Spanish culture, she is known as Our Lady of Guadalupe. In Germanic, Our Lady of Lourdes. The Black Madonna in Poland and Puerto Rico, Our Lady of Fatima, and Our Lady of, of the Snows. The most recent, and this is going back ways, the Pope was upset because he couldn't go back to Poland to venerate the Black Madonna he was overjoyed to go to, the, to Fatima on the anniversary of the assassination attempt, attempt against him to thank Mary for saving his life. When he was in Fatima, he blessed the people, he prayed and burnt incense, and said a mass in honor of and in prayer to and in worship to the Mother of God. As I've already mentioned, if we go around the world, and I'm sure you can hop on the internet, you can hop on YouTube, and you'll find people who have seen or people who are claiming to catch images of the, Mary, of the mother of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And they're venerated highly. If she appears in one spot, it becomes a place of worship. She's been seen beside fountains, springs, and etc. And those sites are deemed as holy <coughs> There are many Catholics. There are many Catholics throughout the world that claim that Mary has appeared to them, often with messages for the world. Some statements she supposedly has made are: "To those who wish to be saved, live a life of prayer, penance, and sacrifice. Pray the Rosary daily. Wear the brown um, scapular and other sacramentals. Keep the statutes in your home." Keep the statues in your home. Concerning the charismatic renewal, pray, my children, that you do not fall into these errors. The search for the Holy Spirit is entering into the realm of Satan. Make it, make it known. The word you call Pentecostals is not of God. It is an error. About convents. Good sisters, return and restore the convents. Mary said, I am the queen of the universe, the mediatrix, or we've learned that's the female version of a mediator, of all graces, but first and above all, I am your mother. Regar regarding these appearances of Mary, the Pope Urban VIII said this, in cases like this, we refer to the apparitions or the appearances or sightings, it is better to believe them than not to believe. For if you believe and it is proven true, you will be happy, and you will be that you believe, because our Holy Mother asked it. If you believe and it should be proven false, you will receive all blessing as if it had been true, because you believed it to be true. If any of these sightings are true, if any of these sightings of Mary are accurate, if someone has actually seen a sighting of Mary, what are they viewing? If someone truly saw a vision of Mary, what are they looking at? A demonic spirit. A demonic spirit. Because we know to be dead, once you die, to be absent from the body, is to be present with the Lord. So there's no coming back. But they'll be looking at a demonic spirit. How do we know that? Because demer demonic spirits look for any opportunity to make their